Okay. Sounds good. All right. So let's go ahead. I'll let, I'll just kind of take a break here, letting people in. We did break a hundred. So great place. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce, uh, uh, John, Dr. John Santier joined SMU back in 2018. I remember right when it happened, uh, when we were at immersion, when I first met him after completing his PhD in artificial intelligence, uh, at the university of Chicago. Uh, he's the lead instructor for our machine learning two, um, and, and very influential in all of our machine learning courses. Uh, very fortunate to have John uh, leading the effort there. Um, a course that he designed and recorded and taught and updates all the time and is currently updating it right now. His uh, background is uh, fairly, fairly atypical, we'll say. Uh, he was an English and film major who transitioned to academia and computer science uh, at the age of 30. I believe also, were you a photographer as well, John? Is that what I remember? Yeah, yeah also. Yeah, exactly. So great photographer. Um, uh, John has worked as the principal data scientist at SAP. That's when I first met him and was creator of SVP's short-lived AI lab, amazing space for creativity and, uh, and curiosity and uh, ingenuity. He currently works uh, with Dr. Andrew Ng with deeplearning.ai. Perhaps you heard of the inventor of Coursera and uh, a huge leader in the field. Uh, John is his right-hand man um, and holds an academic appointment at uh, none other than NASA. So, um, and that is just kind of scraping the surface. Um, above, uh, somehow above and beyond all of that, um, I've, I've known John now for, for quite some time in, in terms of career. Uh, you'll ne never meet a more uh, generous uh, person with their time, with somebody, of course, none of us have any time. John's super generous. He's had so many capstone projects, um, just genuinely awesome person. Um, he's created a lot of value for all of our uh, graduates and continues to do so, and he's continuing to do so tonight. So thank you, John. Thank you for everybody being here. I hope it's, it's evident how uh, excited we are, and I'm so excited I can't stop talking. So I'm going to go ahead and give it over to John, and uh, without further ado, big round of applause, however you want to give it. I present to you Dr. John Santier. Hey, hey everyone. Thanks for the uh, warm introduction. Uh, Vivian, it's this is fun. This was a fun discussion to have because I thought it would really put me on the spot to try and come up with something that brings together some conversations and a lot of work that's been going on really since um, SVB failed, right? It, if you know a little bit about my background, um, right about the time SVB failed was when LLM started getting exciting. So in the late spring, I really started to throw myself into this space and this brings together um, sort of the last almost a year, I guess, of, of thinking about how we could use these tools. Um, started very naively and have worked my way up in terms of depth. So that's that's been a great deal of fun. So um, the title of our talk really is Rethinking Software Engineering in the Age of LLMs. And this is joint work. This is uh, work that uh, would not be possible were it not for co-collaborators. So I really appreciate immensely um, Joaquin for his support uh, in with me in terms of trying to figure out a lot of these pieces. The presentation you'll see, if you know me, uh, is much better than what I would normally present. So thank you, Joaquin, for the graphic design, but also for the code. So many of these places, you know, this is, speaks to me about kind of the path forward, which is that we can't do it, everything on our own. This space is moving much too quickly to do that. And there are many people that I collaborate with regularly just to keep up and running. So. Um, if you don't know me, if we haven't met um, already, I'll give you a little bit of my background. As Bivin indicated, uh, it's very different. I was joined uh, CMU in 2009, to late 2009, early 2010, and that really was coming from a world of photography. So I had this, this life as a, a still photographer and then moved into academia and have been oscillating between academia and industry for the last 15 years, which starts to feel like a really long time. Um, Carnegie Mellon, University of Chicago, Argonne, uh, teaching after I graduated, but also working in industry with my early work at United Therapeutics, uh, Nalco as, as an, an, an intern. Um, one of the things I recommend all of our students do is to go get some internships. Um, I had to do the same thing myself a long, long time ago. And then working at Trigger Health, uh, building uh, data science projects. That was the chief data scientist there to build a, a single electrode, uh, excuse me, a, a, a early predictor of um, uh, activities for um, individuals who are in uh, relapse, relapsing from alcohol addiction or opiates addiction, SAP working on all these different projects, and then also with the capstones that we've been able to do with SMU. And SMU has been wonderful in terms of giving a wide variety of opportunities to work in, in different domains. 
as Biffin mentioned, I was at uh, SVB building their data science lab before it crashed and then found a home now with Andrew Ng where I'm working on special projects. So a nice mix match of uh, processes and it's really finding that interface between what we do in industry and what we are learning about in academia. Right at that bleeding edge is where I like to play. So let's get right into the heart of it. Um, why do we even care about this topic? Don't we already sort of know that um, large language models are just sort of a, a replacement for Stack Overflow for software engineers, right? We, where we used to go to um, Stack Overflow and, and look for sources of pieces of code that we could leverage to answer questions. Now we can enter that same query rather than Google. We can enter it directly into something like ChatGPT and we get, we get back a result that looks very good. You know, the FizzBuzz problem in Fortran, a language I don't speak, and we can get a result uh, very quickly, and it works pretty well. And we sort of think of this uh, at this point as seeming almost passe. Almost a year ago, students were very excited about what the opportunity is now. If I talk about leveraging um, ChatGPT to learn to become a better coder, most people will say, yeah, yeah, we know how to do that. We, we know how we want to use these LLMs in our normal workflow. And I understand that to some extent. But part of our conversation today is about how that's not everything. And so what's fascinating to me, having watched this progression start from you know, blowing out the back of a, a cartridge to put into a Commodore 64, to being able to give natural language prompts to a AI, is that many of the things that we aspired for, the things that we really hoped we would get, they're now things that we're trying to control. So where we once were looking for a model a way of interacting with the computer that was expressive, that was ambitious in terms of its, its conversation with us, we're now frustrated in many ways that that model is ambiguous in its response. So that expressivity that we get out of the large language models also becomes problematic because it is, um, it's ambiguous. It's not necessarily clear exactly how we should interpret certain aspects of its behavior. Similarly, models that are creative which we have been looking for, something that wasn't simply mirroring exactly the training data that we give it, there's a spark of originality, means that that model is also non-deterministic. So now we're in a situation where we're not clear, given one input, what our outcome will be. And this has been the truth you know, for the progression of AI for a very long time. What we once think is the destination that we're looking for, once we've arrived at that place, we realize there's new lands that we can explore, new opportunities, new data sets, new tools and techniques. So if LLMs aren't just a replacement for Stack Overflow, what are they? Well, if you've been working in the industry in the last you know, six months, you'll know the easy answer is, of course, that, rags, that LLMs are really just about RAG. They're about retrieval augmented generation. And so we see a tremendous amount of adoption of AI specifically related to the ability to score large sources of documents and then find solutions. Now, for data science scientists today, you may think of this as, you know, this is cute and it's a nice solution. From my perspective, this is a conversation, a problem that we've been trying to solve for 20 years. This is the information retrieval problem. And it goes all the way back to PageRank. PageRank really was an information retrieval problem. And all through the early aughts, the computer science community was fighting to try to find ways to bring the functionality that PageRank seemed to deliver for the internet um, to individual stores of data conferences, workshops, everything developed around this. And while there's a tremendous amount of detail here, we're not going to go into this RAG solution because I think we understand it pretty well. And this is another good moment when we talk about moving forward as a group, as a community. Wow, there's a lot of details here, right? When I started this conversation um, in the summer, it was Joaquin and Hen who held, sort of walked me through all this process and laid out a lot of what these pieces are. And it takes a, a long time to get to the point that you can understand how all of the pieces fit together. So this is, this is pretty significant and important. But we're not going to be talking about RAG today. Instead, we're talking about control flow graphs, the order of execution of function calls. And this, I think, is something that's growing in importance in our community. I'm by no means the originator of these thought processes. But I think they're the direction that we should be thinking about as software engineers and as data scientists, because they speak to the advantages and disadvantages of LLMs. And they also point us in the direction of where we're likely to go forward next. So let's just start with this notion of what a control flow graph looks like. So in a typical scripting situation, something you might do as, as you might in a master's program, we start with a function, we start with a, a, a file like a main, and that main calls a series of functions, function one, function two, function three. In the most extreme example, we have a file where we start at the top and we iteratively move down line by line, executing each function until we've completed the file. And this is linear and this is great, this is fine. There are many problems that can be solved by this. 
And for most master's programs, we sort of stop at that level of software engineering. But if you know me as an instructor, you will know that I'll never take up the opportunity to rip on one of two topics, either Pandas or Notebooks. So I'll bring up my Notebook moment here. Notebook, the reason, the fundamental reason that I have a, a problem with using Notebooks, especially for students as they're starting to learn, is that while that cell one, cell two, cell three, cell four, top to bottom, in terms of the notebook looks like what you would expect. In reality, we execute one box, another box, then we go up to the top. And so you have this very complicated pattern of interactions that are very hard to untangle. Right? In this situation, we know, for instance, that function one is a child of, of main, and function two is a child of function one, and function one is a parent of function two. We would assume that cell two is a child of cell one. But in actuality, the notebook allows us the flexibility to execute them in different orders, and that order is never recoverable. So oftentimes that introduces bias. So we'll skip away from that for a moment and continue with this notion of a, a more typical, more advanced style of software engineering, something as it should be done right, is something like a directed acyclic graph. That is, you have a graph that has a series of spots you might start, and when, in the most simple, you have a, a main file that calls a function and returns and returns, and it may run these in different orders. It's a very simple structure. It's just a tree. Or you may have multiple source nodes, where in this case, uh, node seven can call node 11. It also might call node eight. But you'll note that the child nine never is a parent of eight. It's always a child of eight. And, it, and nine is never a parent of 11. It's always a child of 11. So we start at the top in this particular graph and work our way down, and we can never return back. Now, not every function, not every description of software. In fact, few software files are, are as simple as this. So we end up with a control flow that perhaps looks more like this, where we have a main function that calls a series of functions. And perhaps in our situation, function one calls function five, and function five calls function two, which in turn calls function six, and then returns to function five. And in this situation, we have a small cycle. And this cycle means that it's indeterminate. You know, when you're looking at function five, unless you look at the log files, you can't be totally clear whether or not function one has been called, or function two was called, and then function uh, six, and then moving back to five. But what's nice about this, and what's great about these sort of cyclic graphs, is that you still can see the, the sort of hazy outline of everything that's happening. You get a lot of details that do work. And if you want, you can remove your cycles by doing something called cycle collapsing. So you would just simply collapse this cycle into a single node, and say main can call function one and this hyper, uh, this hyper node, or main might call this hyper node directly, and they'd both end up at function nine. And what that does is it allows you to abstract away. Of course, you don't know if this loop runs 100 times or 1,000 times or four, but it allows you to move back and use all the tools that you can work with with directed acyclic graphs. It's a very nice advantage and something that, that makes things a little bit easier for us. All right, so if we have this control flow, the, the question is, why are we bringing this up in reference to LLMs? Again, this isn't a RAG model. This isn't our conversations about, uh, about answering questions on Stack Overflow. So what I'm proposing and what I'm speaking about is the work that's being done now to use the LLM really as the center decision maker of all function calls in your software. That is, the LLM acts effectively as an instruction set. And this is a very, very different paradigm than what we've been working with. The LLM acts as the router, the decision maker of whether you should move to function one, function two, or function three. And so you have this bi-directionality. Function one both calls the LLM and the LLM calls it. And what this does is it makes our problem of just understanding for large code bases or complicated processes, what once was a large code base, now can become a very small code base because the LLM is performing a lot of that, that structure and that flow that previously we had been thinking about. This introduces some really interesting realities and it's, it's part of this this conversation that we need to think about how this works from a software engineering perspective. It's worth noting that these LLMs, everything is included in the prompt. That is, LLMs functions only accept a single string as an input. That's not technically true because now we have some uh, LLMs that can work with images as well, but in general, this is the way to, to frame the problem, at least initially. And what this means is that it means that you have a main function that kicks off and by, by virtue of its interaction with a free string text, you feed to the LLM that eventually will call a function and that function will return something in a string and that string will be interpreted again by the LLM. 
So our default data type is a string of perhaps an extremely long length. And this is extremely relevant for us because it means that if you want to have a chat history, well, that's just prompt engineering. What you do is you collect all the conversations that you've had, you dump them at the top of your prompt. At the bottom, you say, hey, here's a question, refer up to the top this record of what we've been doing. It means that if you want to have a user profile, you write a sketch of the person that you're working with. You know, you have a person that your user 25 has this background, they've been involved with us in this way. You put that at the top and at the bottom, you then put the information of whatever question you have, but it's just free text. You want to have a few short, few shot learning scenario. Again, you put some examples of how your model behaves, the ways that you think it did a good job or a bad job, you comment on that. And then you ask the question that you'd like to down below. This means that the software we use to manage LLMs, whether it's Langchain, whether it's Llama Index, any of these tools, they're an abstraction for managing the data to construct the final prompt. Now, this might sound a little bit obvious, and, and there's been a lot of talk about prompt engineering in that career, but it's pretty fundamentally fascinating to me that given all of the all of the work we've done to move towards, you know, structured data sets, you know, Python just now gives us this, this type hint so that we even know what types we're working with. We have no types in this scenario. We're working with a scenario where we're just passing strings as our input and returning strings. That's a very different way of building software. It's a very different way of, expect, of setting expectations. And it means that our LLM now encodes most of the complexity that we were looking up in those control flow diagrams. So now we're not in a position to be able to, from the outside, at least understand the structure of how our code is going to execute, right? There still may be bugs, there may be race conditions, there may be other issues, but at least we could see the, the expectation. Now we're relying upon the internal weights of the LLM to make that decision. We've spent the last five years talking about how we want to move from models that are opaque, that are not transparent, that we can't see, to models that you can interpret. Well, now we're talking about taking a dramatic step towards uninterpretable code. Your code base will be as opaque as your deep learning model is, which means that your decisions that you, you make, the behavior of your program is heavily dependent upon where that LLM comes from, what their update cycle is. And that's a very different scenario that we're working with. Okay. So there are two fundamental issues in my mind that you know are sort of the center of what we're thinking about in, in terms of addressing these um and the first really is this idea of what will this beast even return right if you're trying to tame this beast this lm beast what what kind of feedback are we going to get what's the object that we're going to be working with and there's some code here and it's hard to read but it's there and it's available and i'll share the, a link to the slide so you can have a look at it my point here is that it's it's very it's very tight it's very short these libraries do a very good job of making it very easy in a small number of lines to specify outputs, but you have to know which code base to run and you have to find out each week what the newest code base is because it's ever changing. So in this case, we're asking for questions that we answer to be returned in a particular JSON format. And that structured JSON format means that when we get something back, we can have some agreement and you can set up testing for this so that your JSON, when it's returned, it gets checked against the, uh, the standard that you'd like. But the key here is that there's at least an agreed way that's somewhat beyond just free text to both give and receive. And this is crucial because when you're passing functions, when you're, you're passing information to actual Python functions or C or whatever you're working in, you really do need to have structs and types that you're working with so that you can have some expectation. You, you have to have an output that's standardized. There's another fundamental approach, which is that this question of what will even execute when we run this, when we run this code. So, this is pretty important. Right now, if I call ChatGPT and I ask it to perform some behavior or do some, you know, perform some simple like addition or subtraction, it will it will use the entire its entirety of its network to try and deduce what the answer is. What we can do with what are called function calls is we can define uh, define individual functions, comment exactly what the function's behavior is, and then the uh, give these functions to the LLM to, a, again, another library that can manage this and say, these are the tools that you have available to you. You should pick one. And when you pick one, if there are variables and the question seems to align to this, these problems that you have, these, these tools available, you should go ahead and do it. So in this case, you know, we define we have some addition, we have maybe some multiplication. 
And you can ask, can you add the numbers together? And it will recognize that can you add some numbers together is simple or sim sim uh, similar to the comment that you have that's you know, adding numbers together and return the results. Well, that's a good, that's probably the function that I should use. And it will execute that code. And so in this case, what we've done, again, right, every, what we wanted for flexibility, we wanted this flexible expressive model, and we had that. And what did we do? Well, we asked it to really limit its response to just working in JSON. And then we had this model that allows us to use all of human knowledge. And we said, well, we're not sure that you're going to behave exactly the way that we want. So we want to limit you to a set of tools, or at least give these tools to you as a first pass. And this is one way that we can you know, shape and change the behavior while still leveraging the strength of what the LLM does very, very well. But there's a different approach and one that we also can, that we also can consider. We can embrace the chaos. We can first embrace it alone in something like Autogen. And what do I mean by that? Well, in this case, what we can do again in a small number of, of lines, these are standards, so it's another 30 lines of just set up. But the point is it's not very interesting and you don't have to do this separately for any particular problem. It's, it's all boilerplate. You can ask the autogen a question, like take the numbers, three, four, and five, take the first letter of each of the numbers, find that letter's position in the alphabet, and then multiply those positions together. Pretty simple problem, but at the same time, it's the kind of quiz that we often would give to students or interviewees to get a sense for how they approach a problem, what kind of their, what, what their experience with, with software engineering is. And so what do we get back when we place that in front of Autogen? This is going to be a bit of a, a code dump, so don't, don't, don't worry about that. The key that I want to point out here is that what's going to happen is Autogen is going to go ahead and construct a .py file that it believes addresses the question that you have, and then it will execute that file and then return back the result that you're looking with. So here we see, you know, it's taken the problem, it's created a dictionary that maps the numbers to their spelling as words. So we have one, two, three, four, five. Interesting that the LLM chose to represent in this dictionary one and two, which weren't part of our class, but to stop at five rather than continuing. Defines the numbers to get our, our, our numbers construction, gives us a product. So it's got an, a, a, a number that we're going to use eventually as our final value, and then writes a quick for loop to find the position of the first letter of each word, find out where it is, and then multiplies them together to come up with our result. Now, this is quite impressive. We've moved from a scenario where we're asking the model to give us the code, right, in this Stack Overflow scenario, give me the code that will address this problem, to actually asking the LLM to write that code and execute it. Now, from the designer's perspective, it's perhaps not that much of a, a leap, right? It's not a big deal. Engineering, it's nice to be able to run it. They make some decisions on how they, they do the execution. That's nice. But from a design perspective, we're now specifying just in free text what we want a result to be, and the code is being assembled behind the scenes. And we're being presented back to that so that we can retain it and hold on to it. It's also worth noting that this does not work every time perfectly. So you can try this five times, and two or three times you'll get the right answer. Sometimes you'll get the wrong answer. It's not perfect in that way, and it's, it's not finished. But it speaks to the idea that this Autogen framework can provide us something that's really quite unique and a functionality that we might not otherwise have. So if we were first embracing the chaos alone with a single call of an LLM, you know, when in doubt, bring a friend. And we move to an, an, a new library called Crew AI. And what's nice about Crew AI is it has a very different way of thinking. And this one I, I think is actually really quite worth um, diving into. If I had to make a decision, I probably would pay more attention to Crew AI um, than Autogen right now, um, just, as, just as a young uh, data scientist. And so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to actually make instances of multiple agents. We'll have an agent whose identity is a researcher, and we'll have an agent whose identity is a writer. And in these situations, they'll have different expectations. So the researcher, is their backstory, I love that, they have a backstory, driven by curiosity, you're eager to find information. While the backstory for the writer is with a flair for uh, simplifying complex topics, you craft engaging uh, narratives. And now, similar to what we did with our function calls, we have tasks that we hand, hand to these individuals. We have a research task that is find relevant information about a topic, and we have a writing task, which is given the results back from that topic, from, from um, the last function, write something about this, you know, craft an engaging narrative. And we specify, again, the two agents, which are researchers and writers, 
and the task, which is a research task and a write, write task, and we execute them in order. We expect the researcher to complete their work before the writer picks this up. So what do we do? I thought it would be fun. Why don't we just craft this narrative and ask, why should we go? Why is uh, MSDS, why is SMU a good choice for uh, a, a place to do data science, right? Why is this a great, why is this great university? And what do we see? We see it's an excellent choice for learning data science due to its rigorous academic programs, its strong reputation. It recognizes that the MSDS covers uh, all the essential topics. It notes that in Dallas, Texas, it's a hub for technology, the established relationship and partnerships with local businesses, that as MSDS has a great reputation in the field. It gives us a really rich solution. Now, all of this information, when I'm interested, when I'm instantly looking at this, I'm wondering how much of this is included in the base LLM versus how much did this researcher find this information that we're working with? And so, you know, the next step forward would be to compare ChatGPT versus crew.ai. Let's look and see and ask the same query side by side. So when we, we do this for ChatGPT and we ask, hey, same query, why, why should I choose MSDS? Not should I choose, but why should I? Make the argument. ChatGPT takes a much more distant approach, gives us a sense of the topics that one would be interested in, curriculum, um, faculty expertise. It doesn't make reference to actually the department's expertise. It just says these are things that matter in terms of choosing. And in fact, if you get to the bottom in bold, and that's the only part that I really want you to look at more closely, is that to get the most accurate up-to-date date information about SMU, including the faculty experience, the curriculum, student outcomes, and more, it's best to visit the SMU website and continue and contact their admissions office, right? It sort of hedges its bets and kicks the can down, right? It says, these are the things you want to think about in going to grad school, but I don't really know. I'm not in a position to make a judgment as to whether, not again, comparisons or contrast, but just give me the give me the case for why this matters. Meanwhile, and this will be, if this was hard to read, this is going to be even worse. We get this incredibly dense feedback from Crew AI. And if you were to look very carefully, what you'll see is that there are individual links that reference out news articles. And why is that that's happening? It's because the researcher has been provided API access to DuckDuckGo, and we've specified that the tools the researcher can use can include doing these freeform searches. So now we have a scenario where what we've typically seen is LLMs where we have to wait for a long time. Right? We're always wondering, is this LLM, is the topic I'm asking about current enough or old enough back that the LLM has been trained on enough of the information so that it can get a hold of it? Crew AI lets you get out into the market, search for a particular topic, aggregate that information together, and then have the writer generate it. It's effectively doing RAG, where your um, vector database is now DuckDuckGo, which is quite incredible and changes the kinds of applications we might place, place this. Now, we've barely scratched the surface in terms of this crew AI stuff. There's the opportunity to develop very complicated workflows where you have routers and schedulers and all kinds of different people working back and forth to come up with whatever this whatever this result is. And that's that's really, I think, the place that we're going to see more and more work is not just a single LLM environment, but a heterogeneous LLM environment, however you inst instantiate it, whether it's just making multiple LLMs that, that chat and communicate with each other, or whether it is, in fact, using a library like Crew AI. And if you know me, I like to typically, I'm not library focused, but for this LLM stuff, man, it's really quite useful. Um, so I, I do think uh, investing in the libraries becomes more valuable here than I ever would have recommended for anything else I've ever taught. Okay, I, I wanna take a moment and step back and think about this and note that this conversation we're having really isn't new to CS. It's just an extension of a conversation that's been happening over the last you know, 70 years of, of really you know, computing as we know it. That is, this notion of levels of abstraction, you may have heard me say in class, um, you know, we abstract something away. We abstract away a complexity. We abstract away a problem either to a lower level language, to a different piece of hardware. And this is the basis on how computer scientists think about getting work done. The lowest level, we have this physical hardware. We have the transistors and the circuits and electronic devices that work together um, to be able to, uh, to give you the, the scaffold that you're working with. And then we have digital logic and microarchitecture, individual pieces that are, run, that are connected together that form this, this physical structure that we're working with, that we're computing on. And very quickly, we move to these low level languages, it's like machine code, assembly language, these low-level languages allow us to work more foundationally. In fact, the, uh, the, my background, which is punch cards that my mother used um, when she was in college, this is another example of a different low-level interface 
to interact with a device that allows you to construct um, understanding on the computer. But you had to work really hard to be able to do this. And of course, the growth, the real growth of programming languages has been when they've become more accessible, easier to, easier to use, and therefore we've been able to do more with them more quickly, more efficient, and that you know, Python, C, Java, and Fortran. Many of us wouldn't think of Fortran as being a high-level language, but it is for our purposes. And of course, we can move beyond that to this user, um, this user layer. And here we have software frameworks and labels and, and libraries that allow us to have reusable code. So we have an established language that we can work with. We don't get stuck using having to write everything our, ourselves. And even a little bit higher than that, at the the user layer is this application of you know, user-facing applications like a GUI, something that allows you to perform your job in a more constrained environment that's open-ended, but at the same time, you uh, have flexibility. So there may be some guardrails almost set up in, in that you, you things you can't do that you could do at a high-level language, and there are things you can't do in a high-level language that you could do in a low-level language, and so forth. But some of that abstraction gives us um, some confidence that our models will work and makes us much more efficient. So what we're really talking about today is a scenario where we're looking at an LLM level, right? which is at least at the level of user, and I would argue moving a little bit beyond that. It's moving to this natural language interface. And is this prompt engineering? You know, I, for one, was fairly um, hesitant to believe that the job of a prompt engineer was going to rise in terms of importance to be the center of this conversation. But what I've come to respect and understand is that prompt engineering includes everything, every foundation of how you interact with these LLMs. And part of your prompt engineering is the libraries you choose. It's also the context and the framework that you use to, to put everything together. So it's this, it's this much more expansive than what, than what I had originally um, conceived of and what I had originally been thinking about. So we have this progression. We have a progression from punch cards to command lines to graphical user interfaces to LLMs or natural language interface. And this really is putting it at the heart of this. If we take this example, then we shouldn't think of LLMs as really being a control flow. We should think about LLMs as effectively being a compiler. The LLMs serve as a compiler for natural language, and that natural language we can convert very quickly into code that can be executed through any of the tools that I'm thinking about, whether it's JSON. And the prompt engineering is our, our conversation that we're having with our code in the same way we would have had that with Java or, or C or Python or whatever. So what does this create? You know, where does this drive us in terms of our, our conversation? Where do we end up coming out of this? What's growing in importance? Well, I was scooped earlier this week, um, not surprisingly, by, by NVIDIA's CEO arguing that the goal of computing technology, especially where we are right now, is all about progressing and driving to the point that people don't have to program. And you know, I don't totally agree with the expression they don't have to program because I would argue we're continuing this conversation from low level to high level. We're trying to make it easier to program and allow you to use different idioms and different uh, ways of interacting with devices. But regardless of that sort of semantic point, we deeply agree on the idea that deeper subject matter expert be knowledge becomes more powerful. So if you spoke to me you know, five years ago and you said, hey, John, what are you thinking about how much I can be a generalist or I need to specialize in a particular industry? I would have said, listen, there's all kinds of need for you to be able to work across industry. And that really was what my career was. If you ask me today, is there still that need? Absolutely. But I think the movement, as we make it easier and easier to interact and construct small programs that can perform the kinds of things that we're interested in, it becomes more and more important for you to have deep subject matter expertise because the barrier to developing the code will become easier and the barrier to knowing about subject matter experts will still remain the same. So we'll see more adoption from um, people who have a passive interest in technology, adopting and using these tools in ways that are productive. And so much of our attention, all in fact, all of what we've seen with uh, Langchain and Llama Index and Crew AI, computationally in terms of the software engineering, these tools aren't that hard. I've seen a lot of tools be built over the last 15 years, and normally they take a long time to come out. They're like coming out like hotcakes right now. And the reason for that is that basically all they're doing is like managing this thin layer. It's not computationally deep. There's not a lot of uh, IP that really separates one product from the other. There's better engineering practices. There's a slightly different abstraction. But like it took a long time for us to go from TensorFlow to PyTorch. And MexNet was there. These other languages were around, but those were very deep and hard to work with. We're seeing new software that's usable in production coming out at a pace that's just breathtaking. And all of that is about making it easier and more efficient 
for subject matter experts to be able to get work done. So again, I can see a scenario where we were working very closely with the subject matter expert, but very quickly you're trying to turn over the reins to them to interact again in free text, given that they have the right you know, chat histories and the, the right user context, you've engineered that, they can ask and work independently. It's very exciting along those lines. So what does this imply? Well, this implies, fascinatingly, something that you know we don't think about and we don't teach in master's programs almost universally, is an increased focus on test-driven development. And if there were one thing that I think is perhaps, you know, if I had a, a, a three-month sprint that I could do and, and just tack on another three months in another dimension, it would be really diving into this directly. And the reason for this is that there used to be an idiom or an approach of building software where you would have, you, you and your friends would get together, you'd construct a conversation, you lay out what you needed your code to perform. What are the tests that we're going to run? And you write those tests and you write them very um, specifically. You'd be very technical. And then you'd go back and you'd write code over the course of a much longer time period that solved problems that fit within those tests. And you had a way of agreement. You had a test driven development. You had a way of agreeing of what the final product should be able to perform. And the test served as a way of validating that that was true. Now, what's so important for us with LLMs is today. If you build a system that has an LLM at the center of, of its architecture, the way that I've just, uh, shown you, the speed that we're talking about is going to be happening constantly. You will be pulling that one LLM out and replacing it with another. Perhaps it's fine-tuned, perhaps it's a new release. Perhaps you have to move from a, an old uh, model to a new model. There are some models for image processing out now that had to be extracted because they were trained on child pornography. When you're working at data at the scale that, we, that we're working at, there will be things like that that will pop up that you'll have to contend with. And when you remove your code and replace it, if you don't have robust tests in place, you will have no idea how your code's performing across the diverse ranges of scenarios. You don't have that control flow graph that you can work with. You won't be able to, as a human, inspect it, and you won't want to have to inspect it 25 times, again, if new models are coming out every three to six months easily, uh, and more likely once every two to three months. So test-driven development is something, again, that we don't talk about. Unit tests, um, it's not something that we're thinking about regularly. It's a tricky problem to implement here because often what you're doing is you're asking one LLM to evaluate the output of another LLM. But there are other ways that you can think about this, including our um, you know, JSON frameworks to make sure that it's performing, checking to make sure the code's running, the correct codes are being chosen. Um, there are opportunities there, uh, but it's something that I absolutely would be looking for and am looking for in projects to have um, students who are have increased experience in, in that topic. Strangely, growing importance is that commenting has become in code. Right? And this to me is a bit of a head shake. We've for the long time used commenting as a way of noting one of two things, either establishing a conversation between the author of the code and the future reader of that code base, or trying to make sure that we insert a, con a comment that says, listen, I'm doing something here and it actually makes sense. Right? This is the reason, it's a very particular context. There's something that you might not understand if you just scanned this. And that's where we've historically been. Now with like um, some of the automated commenting packages that allow you to build documentation from comments uh, in Python, we've changed a little bit. But now when we're thinking about function calls, when we provide a set of functions that are available to the LLM and ask it to choose among n functions, the only thing that it knows about which function to choose is based upon which text, which comment of text you've written. So if you write x plus 5 in the comments, right? I'm going to take a number and add 5 to it, but you write below it x minus 5, the code will think it's running x plus 5. It'll find that function. It'll execute and run it. It's not looking at the way the code executes. It's just looking at the comment. And so now the comment becomes the way that we have a conversation with our compiler which is specifically what commenting was not supposed to do, right? The whole point of commenting was that it was just for people. It wasn't for the compiler. But in this case, commenting becomes code. And so I expect we will see a, a change in the way we think about commenting and the way we think about storing information and some standardization around that. And that should be, you know, quite, I think that'll be good for the industry in general. Again, I think this supports, you know, Python's decision to have type hints and everything along those lines. I think all of this is growing, understanding that we need to have some standard way of understanding what our code is that's, that's broad and is not just from a company to company basis, but it's a cross company. And so what does this all require? In my mind, this really is going to end up requiring these full stack 
large language model developer, so a full stack uh, LLM dev. And that stack looks very different than what it has looked like in the past. So if circle back to 2015, we talked about full stack development because we wanted people who could set up a server, execute some code, run all the pieces that would connect everything together. The rise of cloud compute came along a lot of the a lot of those decisions a lot of that infrastructure stuff moved to cloud compute now you're assembling components well we're back to those old days of 2015 for this environment of course the cloud computes are trying to find ways to um, to reproduce the functionality and the ease that they have but in reality if you want to stay at the bleeding edge you're still going to be pulling together your own tools the the large cloud manufacturers aren't moving as fast as the industry is it would be it's hard for any of us to but um, they just aren't, they need everything to be at a certain production grade. If you are a full stack LM developer, you need to be able to construct your database, your vector database. You need to understand all of these different components that I showed at the top. And that's a really hard thing to do. And so they're paying a lot of money for it, right? This is a skill that is, is growing. And it's worth noting that just looking at, just being able to see the whole picture at once and be able to make predictions about how your LLM is going to run, what your latency is going to be, how much data you're going to require, what the cost all of those things, how you should manage your code uh, in terms of commenting, how you should manage your code in terms of test-driven development, how to integrate your subject matter experts, all of these pieces are going to fit into that. And this is going to be an overpaid skill for you know a period of time. It's a good thing to know if that's the sort of thing you're looking at. And uh, because many of you won't have seen this aspect of me, I thought we'd do something that's a little bit silly. Um, the, our future, right? When we look further out, not in the immediate term, but longer term, our future of data science, our future of interaction is actually my past, right? The bypassing motor skills via a brain computer interface is actually my academic origin story. So back in 2010, again, I'm working for CMU and United Therapeutics. Our question was, can we construct using a single electrode, this device that's attached to my forehead, they had a ground in your ear, a single point of contact in your forehead, and you could read brain waves very coarsely well enough so that you could control like a mouse vertical up and down on a screen. And the question for us was, could we, you know, could we take this further? What was that? And that was that research project that was done. United Therapeutics actually um, is a really cool um, biomedical community. And Neuralink that we think about, Elon Musk is the one who's working on that now, but he's looking at implants. And if you're not seeing the flack that he's caught lately, um, he's catching a lot of heat for the way they're doing their regulatory filings. And this is actually Peter in the background. He was my first student ever. Um, Peter and I worked together day and night endlessly. And Peter was a, a very strong programmer when I could barely run a, a command line. And he was patient with me and I could ask good questions. And we went back and forth uh, collaborating on, on that research project, which was, which was quite fun. So as we wrap up, we're at about 40 minutes, so we'll, I'll start to wrap up here. I thought it would be useful to sort of talk about active research and things that I've been thinking about, um, topics that are, are relevant um, to give you a sense of kind of how I'm approaching this as much as I can talk about it. The first is um, we have this active engagement with, with NASA that we have uh, you know, SMU alums, uh, Ahmed, uh, Andrew, and Hen that have been really helping along those. There's many others. Connor, of course, is with us, who's, who's the PI for the project, and we have uh, other researchers as well. But, but for our SMU alums, um, we, we have these three. And we're looking at images of uh, Europa and trying to understand if we can use image models and if we can use um, large language models to come together to do classing and tagging and classification that otherwise wouldn't be possible with, with humans, uh, at least at a scale and speed, how these tools can work in this kind of a scientific computing environment. Very cool, very fun, and also lots of opportunity to get it right uh, and to get it wrong and lots of, uh, lots of space along those lines. And next, um, I'm working on this interesting advising role um, to help this company called Aquilo that's um, with, with Richard and Joaquin. Um, and in this case, what they're looking at is a very different problem. They're interested in scouring the internet, collecting a, a set of resources, taking those resources and bringing them in, synthesizing them and building summaries. So they have a record or a way of understanding the state to see the world through a particular lens. And they're very interested in gender equality and understanding how you know, individuals who are at a disadvantage have availability or lack of availability to resources. So they're interested in talking uh, you know, a global problem but they're trying to do so in a computationally efficient way and a nimble way. And our last, unfortunately, is NDA, but I thought it's worth pointing out. Again, deep learning AI, where Joaquin and I are working together with, with Andrew on a set of projects that I hope we'll be able to talk about soon. Um, but it deals with this question of how humans interact with, with LLMs and uh, comes at the, the, interaction of, the interaction space of how do we think about how we construct software such that we can get the results that we want for individual individuals. So um, 
we'll stop here. Uh, I'll drop a link to our slides here in our chat. Um, there's a link, if you don't know me, to connect on uh, LinkedIn. And there's also a link for the Santera AI channel. So if you haven't heard enough from me tonight, there's more videos that are there. Um, as Ryan Bass always says to me, like and subscribe. Um, I appreciate the time. Vivin, this has been really fun. Um, we've got lots of time. I don't have a hard stop, um, so I'm happy to hang around and, and chat with people and don't have to dominate the conversation. All right. <clears throat> well, however we do it on Zoom, big round of applause. That was awesome or just rah, rah. Uh, this is great. Um, I guess we just kind of see how this goes because uh, we've got, again, a great group. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know how we can uh, possibly get any questions, but let's see, let's see how yeah. that works. Um, I'm gonna say, let me jump in this chat window. Thank you for everyone. And I'm going to just sure. do a quick scan and see if, um, there are, and if you've had a, que a specific question, please feel free to drop it at the bottom. Adam, I don't know what the prompt flow archives are. I would be very interested to know what that is. Maybe you could drop a link. Um, Yes, I, my guess is that, so Ian, with re, with regards to Andre's talk about an LLM-based OS, that is exactly the same framework we're thinking about. And it both gives me great hope because it's incredible to think that a single neural network of whatever its size is capable of performing all of these functions. And it's quite impressive to see um, what I used to use complicated control flows to make decisions to just hand it to the LLM and ask it what it should do. And the LLM gives me the answer back. If we construct it with a JSON to restrict, it becomes very powerful. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more of this. But the problem is going to be, I think, that the we, it'll be very hard to debug. It'll be very hard to understand how this model is going to perform. And so we're almost going to have to um, simulate. I mean, I almost think, Vivian, about like MCMC simulation. We're going to run hundreds of simulations just to understand probabilistically how this model runs. And that becomes like an extremely interesting space because now you're asking that you've got a design time that's much faster, right? You can work very quickly, uh, and I can stop sharing my screen too. You can work very quickly to develop new new results, but at the end of the day, um, your results aren't necessarily going to be perfect. And that lack of perfection means that, you know, if it's mission critical, right? The the conversation about what was required to fly uh, a a space shuttle to, to the moon, that's a very different standard than how I care about whether or not my Instagram app works correctly. Um, and so I think we're gonna see some ambiguity there in terms of what the right what the right model is. I'm gonna keep grabbing here. Yeah, there's some additional questions in there if you wanna pick one of them. Um, Adam. No, so I think there's a I think this is a really good point, Adam, about whether or not you're actually building the LLM or whether or not you are leveraging it. So I still think right now there's no question that the skills required to build an LLM from the ground up, that is, uh, construct your data, execute it, understand how the decisions you're making, and I I mean, not just reproduce someone else's LLM, but to construct a novel LLM that somehow pushes the industry forward, that that remains definitively in the space of PhDs. Like that's just, you have to be having, you have to have 15 years of experience to do this. And again, it, you don't actually have to be a PhD, but you have to have 15 years of experience. It's this huge amount of time. And so most of the people who I think of in the master's program who are starting a data science group, that's not what they're interested in. And so they're very likely to be thinking about no orchestrating uh, dealing with um, how we manage our code base, what our code, what our code looks like, and everything along those lines. Um, oh, Safik, yeah. Okay, so thanks for prompt flow. Um, maybe you can answer, Safik, if you know if that fills in. So there's these. This is the other part that's interesting. Is there's a collection of tools that are coming out from the cloud enablers, you know, the cloud providers, that are supposed to make things easier, and it, they are. Um, what I don't know is I don't know how flexible they are um, in terms of the utilization down the line. We, we know that they're going to be helpful. We know they're going to bring a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't have computing or engineering resources to the table. We just don't know how, um, if you have those computing resources, these are going to be optimal. Um, Courtney, um, in terms of... I think, I think actually the product complexity... Interestingly enough, 
simpler apps that just require, if I wanted to put together an app that made a series of decisions based upon an email that was sent to me, right? Like a sentiment analysis that made a quick routing decisions, where I used to think about having to have a training data set constructing some sentiment analysis classifier, knowing that I was going to have issues. I literally now just, you know, say client, you know, LLM equals client, put in my connection details, say LLM is this, you know, is this comment positive or negative? It tells me positive or negative, and then I move on. And I say, if it's positive, go do this. And if it's negative, go do that. And so there's this very low bar for what, I mean, it's frightening to me in a way because it's good for the industry, but it's frightening. We had done this proof of, proof of concept over the summer um, with Aquilo and we're like, okay, well, how much do we trust these? And we're like messing around with it. And I'm like, I did my normal TFIDF representation of text. And then, you know, something like a PCA to a TSNE to get a clustering. And then we did a clustering and we're like, oh, this is cute. And then we just ran, we asked, we said, hey, LLM, can you cluster this topic into five topics? And it's like, yep, here you go, here you go, here you go. And the results were better from the LLM than from the normal workflow. And for me, that was a real wake up moment because it meant up until now in my whole design of machine learning solutions, I've thought it's on, it's the, it's the onus is on me as a software engineer, as a data scientist, to be able to demonstrate to the user that they can trust this model. Now, the quality is on the, the sort of weight is the expectation I have is that the model's actually going to do a good job. I'm actually surprised when it doesn't. And that's when I roll it back and say, ah, okay, huh, it's fall, it's failing on this. I would have thought it could have figured this one out. What is it failing on? Now, the one thing that I will say though, is that you have to have problems that can be handled with true or falses or that require that kind of context. So this is still, it's not clear to me that if you wanted to construct a complicated, um, function call scenario that it would be optimal for you. And that actually gets back to kind of one of the questions we've been working really hard with these different stacks. Um, uh, no, notably, Gradio, Gradio has been the tool that gives us the greatest flexibility for working with these kinds of tools and builds prototypes. So that's like another find that I've had that I, I wasn't expecting. I was expecting um, to use some others. Joaquin, can you write down the others? Cause I'm blanking on their other names. Um, that, that we explored. But Gradio right now is like, I would be looking at Crew AI, I'd be looking at Gradio, um, and I'd be looking at any scale as the LLM provider. Those are like my, that would be my cheat sheet for how to get this up and running. Um, so I wanna address the fine tuning um, and, and RAG conversation, because I think it's really interesting. And I, I'm not fully, I don't fully have a perspective on this, but I had a surprising one. Um, the Thanks, Joaquin. It's, it's Streamlit, Chainlit, and Gradio. Uh, Streamlit is the sort of industry standard. Stroud's done a lot of work with Streamlit as a big proponent. Chainlit is really good if you want to make a very fast, lightweight chat interface. You just want to have a chat bot, that's it. Um, Gradio lets you have more flexibility in building like widgets and, set, and sections and, and conversations. So. so typically I had been thinking that fine tuning, you know, you've got an LLM, which first has an architecture, then you take that architecture and you feed it a collection of data. That data um, can, you know, be quite extensive or quite small, depending upon what you're working with. Um, but I had excluded fine tuning as a reality. I, I think there's, there's something to be pointed out here, which is that if you're looking at making decisions, like here's a document, is this document have a positive or negative sentiment? you can use a comparatively smaller LLM than if you need to have the LLM construct complicated text. So if the question is, given this snippet and, and the topic is negative, write an apology response. That requires a larger LLM, something like these 70 billion uh, parameter models, where something like a 7 billion parameter model does a just fine job saying, no, in fact, this is a negative or positive. So I've come to think that classification and decision tasks can be managed with a smaller LLM, and when you need to write, you need a larger LLM. Well, if I need something written and I need a large LLM, do I really want to train something from the bottom up? I don't have those resources. We interestingly, it should be, and we do have some great resources at SMU, but even still, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. What's interesting is that um, in working with something called, Joaquin found this thing called, it's News Research. They have through Hugging Face, these uh, models that are designed to be a chat interface. And so now you get a conversation that actually happens between individuals. It sounds like not some, not a robot answering your question like OpenAI can, you know, here's a question, here's an informative response, but rather it's conversational. So my hypothesis, what I'm thinking about right now is when you want to change the kind of personality of the LLM, fine tuning starts to make sense. 
if you want to change the subject, the, its context or its view of the world, that becomes where RAG is our solution. So you can, you know, set up your RAG model. So your the space that the LM can respond to is very much guardrailed within a certain range. That seems pr seems pretty straightforward. Um, and that kind of that's the space that I'm thinking about. So, you know, you, you want new information. You set up Crew AI to go out and query it. You want to make sure that you're only working in a very small area. You have kind of like a RAG model. You want to change the tone dramatically, not make it speak like a pirate, because um, just prompt tuning can make the LM speak like a pirate. But I mean, really, really detailed changes in its tone. Then you might move not to prompt engineering, but to actually fine tuning. Most of us won't need to fine tune, though. I would I would say that in general. Um, Patricia, I think the foundation models are, are largely ready for, for prime time. They are, they are good. They, we, today, I think we will see over the next two years such dramatic adoption of them that they're only going to get better. Um, I think, Walter, for advice for junior engineers, I do think that just being able to see the landscape of what's happening and being trying to stay on top of that, you have time as a young engineer to read. I don't expect you to push out a product deliverables constantly. But what I do expect you to do is to get on Hacker News and read, to get, get on Reddit and see what people are working on. Um, because I think that's something that, you know, is feasible. And then you bring back and say, hey, there's this new model. Hey, there's this new thing. There's this, do you think it's a good idea? Some of them will be, some of them won't. Um, but at least we've, we've got that as, as the backdrop. Um, yeah, so I think, Sattvik, with regards to theory, this is really interesting because you, you've heard me historically be very strong in terms of the importance of theory and believing that it's only through this kind of you know deep understanding of theory that we're going to you know move ourselves forward well um now it's a little bit different right now the question is you know these tools are being the foundational models are being trained by large organizations those large organizations are um, handing them to us they're they're giving them to us fixed um, we don't have the resources to train them there is going to be a separation between those who need to understand theory because they're working on the foundational models and those who need to understand better engineering because they're working on using those foundational models. Um, I think that's that's pretty. I think that's a pretty big separation. A another question here is how do you think about bias? And I think that's incredible here. Um, decision bias. Like we've we know that our models, as as I stated, right? There was just this model that was retracted around the the new year uh, because a collection of child pornography was included in its training data set. Um, and it's not clear exactly how that might generate material on, the, on, on, its, on its exit. But the key point is that there is, we will not, when you're scraping the, the internet at the scale that these LLMs are, there is no way that you're able to address all of the bias type issues. And if we look at the mishandling of um, the prompting from Google recently, where they placed very aggressive, they seem to have placed I think they've stated that they placed two aggressive prompts to ensure diversity in terms of the response. Um, that's going to just continue. There's no question that um, we're going to continue to struggle with those situations. And now that bias is not just in the image generation. It's not just in the text that's being executed. It's potentially in the logic of the execution. So if you now ask, given this profile, make a decision, which the LLMs will be better and better able to do, that LLM that's been run on this large data set is potentially extraordinarily biased. Um, so I think uh, how far are we from trusting multi-agent systems that respond to us? I, I think it's going to be really curious. One of the things they're working really hard with Crew AI and others is making transparent what's being executed and how it's being executed. So you can look at those logs. But man, if you start to look at those logs, you get lost in them so quickly. And so we're in a spot where we're building these log files, but we aren't actually able to process them. We're trying to, you know, again, if the central thesis for using LLMs is to make development faster and more efficient, well, <laughs> that's, that doesn't mean you want to go through your log files. So now you have to write an LLM that can parse your log files to understand if things are executing correctly. And you have this scenario where the snake's eating its own tail, and it's not clear how we break out of that. And it's not clear that our LLMs, right, that, that we're working with, if they, in fact, are capable, right? Are these LLMs, is one better than another at these different roles, right? Do I do I set up, you know, a, a Mistral model against um, uh, against Llama? Where do I make those decisions? And how have I tested things so that I understand how to make those decisions? And I think that's really quite curious. 
So Solange, in terms of where the models are being updated, they're being exclusively updated to the big, big tech companies, right? The big tech companies are doing, gathering new data, gathering new information. They're trying to, to push that arms race. What's interesting is we're seeing this pivot towards closed source models, which poses interesting problems. The major problem with that is that unless they start allowing you to fix certain versions of their model, your control flow changes underneath you. If your job is to run a model and you can you sort of figure out how to work with one particular model and they do another release, you're in a situation where everything's changed. This is not quite the same as, you know, think about all of the work that goes into the release of the new Python development framework. It's like, oh, this is going to be deprecated. We encourage you to change your code. This is going to be deprecated. Things are very slow. Well, in large language models, there's huge advantage for them to just move very quickly. And when they move very quickly, that doesn't prioritize our ability to anticipate or make, to understand those changes. And so I think that's going to be a major concern for us going forward is at what cadence they make those changes. It, even for something as simple as a company that's trying to generate tags and interpret you know, research reports, you have very different responses from version to version. I certainly feel like um, over the course of the last eight months, ChatGPT has responds differently to me today than it did then before. Um, and I, not for the better, uh, it feels more distant. And that's driven me to, to look at more open source models. Um, uh, so I think actually about how important domain knowledge is in generating these prompts. There's a great, there's some great examples that if you can speak the language, if you want to do image uh, generation and you can speak the language of art history, wow, you can elicit such much more curious and interesting frameworks, right? So you're in a place where when you can speak about, not in the way the LLM even expects, but just speak to it from the perspective of others whose data has been collected from the internet and has been used to synthesize this, which is gonna be art history books, you then can re you know, make reference and, and uh, get, these, get this information out. Now, the interesting thing about that, getting back to our point of open versus closed source, is that all these open source, all of these closed source models, these companies that are servicing these tools, they have a tremendous amount of restriction in terms of, you know, they, they have a liability and some risk to reputation depending on how they, they implement that. And so for us, there's a real debate about whether or not we want to work with an open source model just so that we can get a raw answer. So I'm not living in a place where they um, put like a fork on the, you know, a cork on the end of the fork so you don't poke yourself in the eye. You're willing to accept some risk. And, you know, this is an important point. We make decisions to continue driving our cars, even though we know it's one of the riskier things we do on a regular basis because we accept and tolerate some of that risk. As we move forward, do we accept and tolerate that risk from the the, the LLM developers, or we have this kind of framework where it's it's very um, very limited. Oh, Paul, you you opened the real one, right? Um, to what extent are we using these tools are going to limit or diminish the creativity? And you know this is one that's really near and dear to my heart because the photography community, which I left in 2010 because it was clear to me post the the you know economy collapse in 2008 that things were never going to go back to where they were. You can even see the people who are talking back fondly on 2015, where things were, were tough and hard. And um, if you look at graphic designers and you listen to researchers, I was just on a call um, with uh, Ben uh, Zhao from uh, U Chicago, and he talks about how um, he's really interested in protecting uh, creatives' material because their material is their lifeblood. And he said, "You've we have regular instances where they're seeing people who had a certain... Uh, drawing style that was unique to them and they had custom work and this was you know inexpensive individually but collectively allowed them to continue their lives um, you know they would make like small note notepads or small drawings for like a wedding and that would they charge a hundred dollars for that it wasn't a lot of money but those things add up and they, because someone wanted that framework and now what they're seeing is that people are using their tools to generate their own material and bypassing them and they've watched their work you know really really nice nose dive and then the question becomes, if there is no path to profitability, do we see a scenario where people don't invest because there's no way you can sustain it? It's only a craft, it's only a labor of, only a labor of love. Um, and I think the question of sameness becomes interesting because, you know, for me, when we look at OpenAI and we look at some of the responses that we get, we get this sort of very narrow range and we can push harder to get something that, that has a little bit more meat. It's, it's a little less general. But ultimately, these models require new data 
new visions, new understandings of the world, which can only come from, at least currently, outside, uh, our, outside and with humans. And this reminds me, this moment where we're saying, I'm afraid of this future, reminds me of like 2007, I was at um, MIT Media Lab, like going to their lectures, to just like a lecture that I'm doing here, where they'd have outside speakers to come in and talk. And one of them was, we were talking about regularly this idea of echo chambers. The idea that you'd go in and you'd talk to people and you'd only talk to people like you, that yourselves because the recommendation engines would drive you to that. And it was a full eight years later that we saw all of the problems with echo chambers come out in terms of elections and kind of magnifying all kinds of, all kinds of problems and, that we're still dealing with. And, and this conversation today has that feeling of something we all know and dread that's coming that hasn't arisen yet. It, it seems like it's going to be there. Um, and I think that's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not bullish on that. I, I am concerned. Um, and I certainly, if I had a friend who was interested in painting, I would be thinking about ways that, um, that they could earn a living that wouldn't be possible to do other than, you know, be reproduced in, in a digital format, which probably means painting a house, like getting involved in mural work. That'll be a long time. It'll be a while before we can get to having robots that can perform that sort of things. Um, yeah. Wow. What do you think about websites that are out in the net in future of website development? Yeah, that's a, um, I think that's, I, th I think websites are, huge space that can be redesigned. I think they're extremely simple. I think our expectations, if you look at spaces that I think are likely to be turned over, is if you go to something like Squarespace and you see that most people can use a quasi template and accomplish most of what they hope to achieve, that means that the space of complexity that's required is actually much smaller. We don't need all of the complexity that's out there. And it's a byproduct. It's, you could call it an inefficiency of the market, right? If we took that kind of approach, or you can say that there's opportunities to make money as an individual, uh, circa 2000 and 2000, actually, uh, one of my friends was taking his summer vacations and he was writing websites for like 3000 bucks. He wrote three websites each for 3000 bucks. He had $10,000. He had more money than we knew what to do with back then. That was a huge amount of cash. And of course that dried up and now you can get a website for $500, which inflation adjusted is like, 150 bucks back then. Um, and that, that, that change is real. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see that. What the question is, does that loss, do those loss open up new opportunities for this nimble development environment to do things that we couldn't do? What new apps will be generated because of these tools that three people can make that it would have taken 50 before something that can be put out in the market for a uh, million dollars rather than 5 million or 10 million. And therefore, uh, somebody can do it with seed money. And then does that potential, um, we all sort of hope, mean that VCs become less dominant in the industry? And so you can, you know, you'll see a, a promulgation of opportunity. That would be a great story that I would hope for, but I'm not sure that I believe it. Um, I don't know, Ryan, that there's much in terms of an ease of being a full stack LLM dev. I think the hard part is that the hard part to become that full stack developer is that you have to set aside three to six months to dive in deeply and then be able to construct either in the cloud or locally solutions that address these needs. And then you need to find a client who's ready for you. So I think right now we have a weird situation where Anthropic is hiring, OpenAI is hiring, but they want a very specific persona. Big companies um, are hiring, but they think they know what they want. Small companies don't even know how to begin. And we don't have a playbook for the small companies. I don't have a playbook for the mom and pop shop that wants to have an LLM and how they should use it. Um, I don't know how, does anybody find the, if anyone can find the link of that, um, it's like a Toyota and they asked Toyota to address a mathematical problem. Does anybody know the meme that I'm talking about? Um, if somebody can find a link to that drop in the thing, it's quite charming because what's happening is that people are just putting a chat GPT on the front of their website and ChatGPT is like, yeah, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll do something, but I'll also answer complicated questions about, you know, mathematics because, you know, I'll, I'm, I'll help you with this Toyota truck too, but, but that's not really what we're, what I'm really focused on. Um, for some questions, Suffolk, uh, that we should be asking as data science and master's students. I, I think the question, the real question that we should be asking, you should be asking yourself is the same question I've said before. Ultimately, you have to decide if you want to make the tools or utilize the tools in the process, in this process. Most master's students want to utilize the tools. They don't want to develop them. 
If you want to develop the tools, then that's one conversation. If you stay in the zone of wanting to utilize these tools, then the question becomes, what are your strengths? If you ask me today, do I want to be go and be a full stack LLM dev? There is zero chance of that, like none. Nothing that I like about what I do um, has anything to do with being a full stack developer at, on any front. It's just, it's using APIs and using libraries is not my thing. However, solving problems is my thing. So then the question becomes, all right, if you uh, don't want to be a true full stack developer, just with the LLM tool set, you want to answer questions. Where can you put yourself where you get to ask good questions and collaborate with people, a company that's large enough that you can um, have opportunities and exposure to different tooling and you can work on different you know, pieces um, uh, simultaneously. I think that's really cool. Yes, yeah, so if this is this is similar to, to scraping social media for facial recognition in 2014, absolutely. There's this time where we're still trying to figure out what we're going to pull together. That makes that makes sense. Um, do I think Vision Pro? I don't know about Vision Pro. That sounds good though. Although it sounds like it could be tra tracking us and tracing us. Um, Asif, yeah, the ChatGPT sold a ticket for the Canadian airline and the judge forced them to oblige. I think that's actually a really important point. Here's a moment where they, they strapped on a ChatGPT, it lied to the customer, the customer uh, believed them, and then the airline tried to deny the fact that they were culpable for the decisions that the LLM made. That's clearly ridiculous in my mind. Um, uh, and I think that's, for me, that's, the, that's a moment where we have to ask, you know, our community you know, what, it, what are the standards, what are the best practices for working with this? And obviously you shouldn't use it to create your legal cases. Um, but interestingly, actually something I was gonna say is that, you know, we haven't in, in this group, I generated this uh, this presentation without any LLMs, although that's actually quite use, uh, unique for me. Almost exclusively now I'm using LLMs in a variety of different ways at a variety of different places. But uh, for this here, I didn't touch them at all. Um, and what I found to be interesting is often when, we think about what it means to, and actually I'm going to drop our, um, the slide, the notes to the slides here, just if you want to click on those, I should have done that earlier. But um, if, if we think about what the rules and expectations are, I, I don't think we really have any clue about what's acceptable. Academics, especially ones who are trying to, you know, sidestep deep, serious research are using this to magnify and create, you know, tech, you know, uh, bulk produce, material, and I'm definitely looking at how to bulk produce material. How do I become more efficient in construction of material for students to push to the um, my YouTube channel to construct so that we can use them in class? I've The ability to use LLMs to construct homework assignments is incredible. Um, but what's interesting is that we still haven't found really the right way of interacting. We're just treating them as queries and answers, queries and answers um, in, in that capacity. Yeah, physicians exactly. Physicians using this to increase the output of their published work to get us, to get things moving as fast as as, as Proch. And Tina, I think you're um, you're correct. Actually, um, we I had a situation where someone came to me and asked, could we very rapidly create a very specific document, not as a final draft for for a lawyer, but they wanted to have the first three fourths written so they could bring it to the lawyer. The lawyer could just spend 45 minutes making changes rather than four hours drafting it, and they were very happy with what that generated. That was a very efficient process. Um, and there's a huge focus on moving. Again, if you want to see what's happening, look at the you know crunch base and see who's being stolen and starting up new AIs and who's getting funded. And the legal space is one that's growing very rapidly because people are looking at this. In fact, um, one of our colleagues um, from both Amazon with Dr. Teneva and, and from um, SAP for myself is going into that space specifically. And, you know, he, he's a He's a deep professional and he should be able to work on that problem very quickly and have a huge impact, huge, huge change in our expectations. Well, an hour and 10 minutes, my voice is starting to go. So I think with that, if, if that's all right, I'll stick around. I'm not gonna go, but uh, let's, uh, we'll call it on the recording. Oh, all right. Let's... Thanks everyone, great to have you. Recording stopped. Oh, bye. Now we're back to being with friends. I like that. It's all family now. <laughs>